diverticulitis. This is a outpouching of the re usually the sigmoid colon, and uh, so there's something called a true diverticula, uh, which is going to go through all three layers of the mucosa. So uh, an example of this would be like Meckel's diverticulum, which usually, uh, which is something you're born with. Um, but diverticulosis, which leads to diverticulitis, is uh, a false diverticulum because we're not really going through all three layers. We're just uh, kind of outpouching uh, the mucosal layer. So, and then diverticulitis is just when you get uh, inflammation of a diverticula, of a diverticulum. Um, so, how, how uh, often does this happen? Happens a lot if you are uh, over 50. So, it, very few people get this when, when they're younger than 40. And uh, around a third are going to be around a third of people over 50 have uh, diverticulosis and 50% uh, of people over 70 have diverticulosis and around two-thirds of people over 85 have, di have diverticulosis. So these people are at risk for diverticulitis. Now, uh, the the main causes of diverticulosis, they are similar to the ones that you see with colon cancer. Um, if you don't eat a lot of uh, uh, fiber, um, then you're going to have more pressure in your bowel. And where's the spot that you get the most pressure? It's right at the end in the sigmoid. And so that's where the sigmoid is going to be the, the biggest uh, site for diverticulosis and diverticulitis. So you get obstruction, and uh, so this, this is talking about uh, obstruction of a diverticulum. And usually they, they will say that uh, you could get a seed stuck in there or you know, a, a small piece of something gets stuck in there and then the diverticula, diverticulum will start to fill up like a balloon and sometimes it will explode or perforate and make a big mess in your peritoneum. So that's when people start showing up at the doctor's office with crampy lower left quadrant pain. Now, I... Uh, it's going to look a lot like appendicitis, except it's on the right side, except this is on the left side, appendicitis is on, on the right side. So a lot of times people will refer to this is left -sided, as left-sided appendicitis because it looks just like it. They come in with that left quadrant, p left lower quadrant pain. Uh, their uh, temperature will be up, usually just mildly. If you got a real high-grade fever, then it may be more complicated. You may have had perforation, which it led to an abscess. Sometimes you get changes in bowel mo bowel movements. If uh, if that's like uh, diarrhea, um, then you're probably not thinking as much about diverticulosis, but but Crohn's. Now Crohn's, you see in the young, the very young, and in the old. So we're overlapping with the, the people that get diverticulosis. So you're going to want to differentiate between these two. And bleeding is, is common. Now, not, but most people are going to show up without bleeding, but... Uh, but diverticulosis is still the most common cause of hematochesia. And uh, in acute patients, then you get distension, tenderness, uh, rebound tenderness of the abdomen. So you want to do an exam. You're going to look at the belly, see if they have any incisions from previous surgeries. 
that might, uh, you know, add to your differential diagnosis. They have, uh, you know, might make you think about uh, abscess or something like that if, if they've had recent surgery, for example. You listen. You know, if they're not feeling bowel sound, or if you're not hearing bowel sounds, then uh, it you could be talking about a perforation. But these are people that are going to, you know, show up in a lot of... Uh, discomfort. If if they don't have bowel sounds, then they're they're really going to be kind of sick when they come in. Um, you can feel a palpable mass with diverticulosis in a lot of uh, patients with diver diverticulosis. And then uh, percussion, if if they are distended and uh, perforated, for example, you might have. Uh, more of a uh, tympanic abdomen. Of course, you do a rectal exam. Sometimes you can feel these things on a rectal exam. They, I mean, they have to be, they would have to be pretty far down for you to feel. Uh, but that, that can, you know, m maybe help you find uh, a, a mass if, if it's not like diverticulosis. So you get some labs. You do the CBC. It can help you to to know if they are uh, anemic. If they're anemic, you know they might be bleeding in there. You know that's the same reason we get the H and H, the hemoglobin hemoglobin hematocrit. The white blood cell count can tell us if there is some infection. Uh, a complete metabolic panel can help us. Uh, to see if the, if they're maybe um, dehydrated, your analysis can tell us if they do have a if they do have a UTI, then it, you you might start considering the possibility of a fistula coming from the sigmoid colon uh, to the bladder. So, um, and then also checking HCG, uh, which will help you know if you want to operate and it will also help you uh, know if you maybe should be checking out some other things. So colonoscopy is, uh, is the big way you take a look at diverticulosis but you're not going to go sticking things uh, in the colon if somebody's got an acute abdomen you know that raises a risk for perforation if it's infected then you you are uh, perforating with all that infectious material so that's not for the acute phase but you can do an x-ray um, and if you see you know free air or ileus that can tell you if we've got uh, if we've got a blockage from the diverticulosis um, very minima again you don't want to do uh, on in the acute setting, but uh, it can tell you if if you have diverticula. And a CT is going to uh, be a good uh, preoperative imaging. On CT, you can see. Um, so here's here's the sigmoid colon right here, and around here. Uh, you get what they call fat stranding, and uh, you know that's a, a sign of inflammation. You also get some thickening of the bowel. If there were uh, perforation, then you can get some extra luminal air. So you get you get air out out here in the um, peritoneal cavity. Um, these things are classified on the Hinchy classification. Um, so Hinchy goes from zero to to four. I believe it's four. You'll have to double check that. But the the Hinchy zero and one A is a good indication that you you don't need to um, you don't need to do surgery right away. So these people you can put on bowel rest. You can give them some oral antibiotics. And uh, you know you can hospitalize them if if you're worried about other things. You know if they have immunosuppression, uh, 
if they're diabetic, anything that that uh, worries you about possible infection, you can hospitalize. And then, of course, there's there's surgery for everybody else. So surgery comes in in two major varieties. One is the surgery that that you do at your own leisure, which means that you don't have an acute uh, abdomen, which you know could could lead to perforation or, or already has perforated. So for these people, uh, you can do you can go in there and you can resect the sigmoid colon, and then you can just reattach the rectum to the descending colon. And uh, in some cases, though, uh, if this is an emergency situation, you may not be able to uh, do a, an anastomosis. So, so sometimes you're going to be diverting the colon and you're going to do uh, a colostomy. And um, that's... In in cases where we're not ready, to, we can't get the bowel ready in time by you know giving the patient time to to clean it out to to go without eating and then and then we prep the bowel by by cleaning it out. Or if there's just a lot of inflammation, that then you don't uh, you don't go in and uh, do an anastomosis a lot of times because it, it's just not going to take. It. This is not going to be as likely to take, and it's a uh, higher likelihood for infection. So, um, and then there's also the Hartman's procedure, which uh, um, basically m means that you are you're going to do a, a colostomy, um, and you you sew up the the distal end of the resected colon, and um, in some cases, you can go back and and re uh, uh, the colon, but th that uh, it doesn't happen sometimes. You know, uh, they're they're difficult to to make that connection again, and so a lot of these people end up just going with a colostomy bag for the rest of their lives. So if we can avoid that, we will. The uh, Surgery um, is it can be done uh, laparoscopically, or a, a portion of it can be done laparoscopic, la laparoscopic, laparoscopically. So you uh, go in and you uh, mobilize the colon, and you identify the mar the margins of the sigmoid which um you know you you find where the tinea coli start to splay and that's where the proximal rectum starts and then at the proximal end uh, you find where where there's healthy descending colon so uh, you're going to start by palpating along the sigmoid wall they describe it as being woody i don't know what that means i haven't felt it so as you as you palpate the sigmoid you will feel a transition as you get to the healthy descending colon where it's not as thick um, and uh, that's where you can uh, you can uh, have the other end of your resection you want to make sure to watch out for the ureters um, you may need to mobilize the splenic flexure if you're going to do a, a primary anastomosis. And uh, so that otherwise you might get too much tension on the anastomosis site and it could, could pull it apart and, and uh, leak. And then once you've uh, done the anastomosis, then uh, you can f fill up the colon with air through the anus and uh, then you fill up the peritoneal cavity with saline solution and then you see if you, any bubbles come out. The anastomosis is uh, done 
either with a stapler or a, a hand anastomosis. Generally, uh, with with a sigmoid resection, you can use uh, an end-to-end -end stapler. So you stick one of the ends of the stapler through the anus up into the rectum, and then uh, and then the other end goes uh, ar around the outside, and that will uh, staple. Uh, it'll leave a row of staples all the way around the anastomosis site, and it will also uh, cut as it staples um, the a, a slice off the end of each of the each of the ends that are anastomosed. Um, after the operation, you want to check for any leakage or just monitor for leakage, th which can be seen uh, with a white blood count going up or you know the patient can get really sick. Uh, bleeding, you want to monitor your uh, hemoglobin hematocrit levels. Infection, again, watch your white blood count and uh, just to make sure that if especially a lot of these are hospitalized patients, you always you're always looking for uh, deep venous thrombosis. Uh, these uh, thank thanks to the images we used, and uh, that's it. Thanks.